Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight for our last study in the book of Daniel. Uh, tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to take about a one-hour overview of the entire book of Daniel, all 12 chapters. And so, as you can imagine, we're not going to get into any great detail. Uh, we've already done that over the past uh, few months. And so, what I'd like to do is just to give us this final study, to give us the bird's-eye view, the overview of the entire book. And having gone through each chapter verse by verse, um, the overview should make sense and uh, bring back to our attention uh, what we've already studied and the importance of the book of Daniel. So um, I do want to uh, just uh, apologize. There are no slides tonight. Uh, having a little technical difficulty before recording this. And so I did ask Pastor Scott if he would go ahead and send out a PDF of all of the notes. And so uh, you should have received that by email. If you haven't downloaded that, you can download that. And uh, all the notes uh, that I'm uh, teaching from tonight are going to be included uh, in that PDF. You're welcome to use that for you know your own study. Uh, if you want to share it with others, I mean, however you want to use it uh, is fine with me. But uh, we, there won't be any slides tonight, so you'll just uh, you know, turn your attention to that document. And if you haven't uh, downloaded that, uh, that's okay. Just follow along and listen. You can download it later and uh, print it out and then have a review of all of the uh, notes that I'm using this evening. So let me go ahead and just open up in a word of prayer and we'll get right into our review of the book of Daniel. Father, we do come before you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to finish out our study in Daniel. We thank you for the time that you've given us uh, to go through each one of these uh, very important and interesting uh, chapters in this book. Uh, thank you that you have given us the reminder, uh, Lord, in every chapter uh, that you are sovereign, that uh, your providential care is upon us and your creation, and that there's nothing in this world, seen or unseen, uh, that will be able to stop your perfect plan. And so we thank you for what we have been studying. Thank you for the uh, information in it, uh, the knowledge, the wisdom, uh, the history of it, uh, the accuracy of it, but most of all, uh, that your word is truth and that we can uh, read it and study it and apply it to our lives and put our entire trust in it. We do thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we begin our study, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of a review, kind of an introduction, and then we'll go through each chapter and I'll just give you a little summarization uh, with a few key verses from each section. I've kind of put together uh, an outline, revised that a little bit, and uh, one or two key verses from each point in that outline that will help us understand the entire chapter. And so I hope that it is uh, beneficial to you. I know it's helped me uh, in my review this past week. So the book of Daniel, when we look at the title, um, really nobody argues that Daniel is the author of this book. Uh, and that is according to the Hebrew custom, Daniel, who was a captive from Jerusalem, taken by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he is the main human character of the book and the primary author of the book. Now, as far as the dating goes, um, we would say that it was somewhere in the mid uh, sixth century, 500 to uh, 536, 530 BC, uh, right in that time period. Uh, there are those who look at a much later date for the uh, writing of Daniel. I talked about that when we went through chapters 10, 11, and 12. Just so much information in those chapters, so many fulfilled prophecies, uh, that many people just can't reconcile an earlier writing date uh, with that kind of accuracy. They don't um, hold to the same views that we do uh, concerning the omniscience of God and, and prophecy. And so they would say that there absolutely has to be a much later uh, authorship date uh, for the book of Daniel. But uh, there's no reason for us to believe that this wasn't written somewhere uh, in uh, 536 to 530 B.C. Daniel was a young man at the beginning of chapter 1 uh, when he was taken into captivity. We remember that the southern kingdom of Judah... Uh, was invaded by Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, many people were taken into captivity. Daniel was one of them, uh, most likely a teen uh, in the, the time of captivity. And so he would have spent his entire adult life in Babylon uh, as a result of the invasion by King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel was a prophet of God, and uh, he was used as a voice of God and an intercessor for both Jews and Gentiles alike. And so his ministry in Babylon wasn't just to the Jewish people. He ministered to the Gentiles uh, as well, specifically the Gentile kings 
of the uh, kingdoms of Babylon and then the Medo-Persian kingdom uh, that followed. Uh, Daniel received special revelation from God uh, and primarily through dreams and visions. And so uh, as we read through Daniel, we will read about those dreams and visions that people have and uh, Daniel is called upon to interpret them or he himself uh, is receiving visions and dreams from God. Excuse me. Uh, Daniel was written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, there's a large portion of Aramaic uh, from chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, verse 28. Uh, and that was the common language of the Gentile world during the Babylonian captivity. So it makes perfect sense that Daniel would have uh, um, written and, and spoke Aramaic. And uh, the book of Daniel is a reflection of that. Uh, some of Daniel's contemporaries, if you're thinking of a timeline here, uh, would be Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Jeremiah, Zephaniah, all contemporaries of the prophet Daniel. Uh, and so the, the background, as I mentioned, this is a, a story that begins with the invasion of Babylon uh, and the Jewish captivity uh, in 605 BC. Uh, Daniel covers a period of time uh, that goes beyond uh, the eventual demise of the Babylonian uh, Empire in 539 BC. Uh, and when the Medo-Persians uh, came in and took control and then they were conquered uh, later on by Greece. And so when you read the prophecies in Daniel, uh, it, it not only uh, is focusing on the time of the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, but uh, into the future to Greece and to Rome, and uh, we believe even into the end times. And so it covers quite a span of time. Uh, the Babylonians, they conquered Jerusalem in uh, two additional stages. And so we know of three deportations, uh, three times uh, when the Jews were taken into captivity. That was in uh, 605 BC, 597, and 586. And so Daniel lived uh, for 70 years in Babylon. And so if he went in as a teen, he left Babylon, or, or when the captivity ended, he would have been in his mid to late 80s. And so uh, the vast majority of his life was spent in captivity in Babylon. And the, the Babylonian captivity, uh, it was a judgment by God upon Judah. And uh, that's a result of all of her many years of rebellion and sin against God, despite clear warnings uh, from prophets like Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Zephaniah. Uh, they heard the word of the Lord and they ignored the word of the Lord. And the result was, is they were taken into captivity. Uh, and when the Assyrian Empire uh, began to lose their power around 625, uh, they were conquered by the Babylonians. And so um, God raised up the Babylonian Empire to come in and take control of uh, the people of Judah. And so that kind of gives us a time frame there of the succession of empires, uh, the Assyrian Empire, conquered by uh, Babylon. And then uh, we see, of course, later on, the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, the Greek Empire, uh, the kingdoms of the north and south with Syria and Egypt, and then again into uh, the future with Rome and uh, the end times with the coming Antichrist. Uh, Daniel was one of the first uh, deportees to go into Babylon. And um, that would have been again in around 597 BC. Uh, and so as Israel had fallen earlier to Assyria in 722, uh, Judah's captivity kind of completed the judgment on the entire nation of Israel. And so God used these human uh, Gentile agents to bring about his um, condemnation and the consequences upon the Jewish people for their rebellion against him. Now, some of the themes in the book of Daniel uh, I think are very clear and they, they come up over and over again. And I would say the main theme of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. Uh, of course, we remember the stories from Sunday school, uh, the lion's den, the fiery furnace. Uh, many people are familiar with the prophetic passages, the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the abomination of desolation. But the, the, the really the, the main focus is that God is sovereign that no matter who is in charge, no matter which king is on the throne, uh, which empire is in power at the time, uh, that God is going to bring about his purposes, uh, not only for uh, the, the immediate uh, um, group of Jewish people, the captives, but all the way into the future, into the end times. And that's very clear through the book of Daniel, that God is always the king of kings and the Lord of lords who sits on the throne, 
and, and he can raise up and he can tear down kingdoms. And we read about that in Daniel. Uh, the events of the captivity that we read uh, in the book of Daniel come from the perspective primarily of Daniel and his companions. And so although many people were taken into captivity, uh, the focus really is on, on four men, Daniel and his three friends, primarily though the prophet Daniel. Uh, the revelation that Daniel received uh, from God concerning uh, the, the coming stages of the Gentiles, it really was about world domination throughout the centuries. And as, as he received that, he was being given these messages of different empires that would rise at different times. Uh, some of the prophecies are a little vague. Some are very, very detailed. But when you look at them together as a whole, uh, they continue to point back to the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, uh, the Seleucids and Ptolemies, and, and then the Roman Empire, a future empire um, known as, uh, to many, a, a revived or a restored Roman Empire during the end times. And so those empires and those leaders are mentioned over and over and over again through Daniel. Uh, again, that, that end times focus uh, will point to that great antichrist to come. And so we can look at many of these kings that are spoken of in Daniel and say that they were an antichrist, a little antichrist, but not the great antichrist. And, uh, but the great antichrist is mentioned, we believe, uh, especially when we get into chapters 11 and 12 uh, during that end time revelation that Daniel received. Now, in all of this, as, as much focus as there is on these foreign empires, there is that promise that God's Messiah will come and he will defeat all of his enemies and restore and bless the people. That really is the great hope in Daniel, that even though you have all of these Gentile nations rising and taking power, and, and the Jewish people suffering at the hands of many wicked leaders. In the end, God is going to establish his messianic king on the throne of David, and he will reign forever in his perfect, glorious kingdom. And so that's the kind of hope that Daniel was given, even though he was receiving many disturbing messages about the things that were to come in the near and distant future. So if we were to break down Daniel into two main sections, we would say that chapters 1 through 6 or the history uh, of Daniel. That is the history of the Jewish people during the Babylonian captivity. Chapter seven through 12 focus more on the prophetic portion of Daniel. So although all of this, uh, all of these revelations were given to Daniel uh, during that captivity, uh, the focus of what Daniel is uh, um, conveying to us, uh, the majority of it is uh, broken up into two categories, the historic and the prophetic. 1 through 6 being the historic, 7 through 12 being the prophetic section of Daniel. Uh, here is how we can break down, uh, just with a brief uh, phrase, each of the 12 chapters. Uh, chapter 1 is the introduction to um, the Babylonian captivity. Chapter 2 is Nebuchadnezzar's image dream. Uh, chapter 3 is the fiery furnace. Chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's vision and madness. Uh, chapter 5 is the writing on the wall at Belshazzar's feast. Chapter 6 would be Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, this is during the time of the reign of King Darius. Uh, chapter 7 is Daniel's four-beast vision. Chapter 8 would be the vision of the ram, the goat, and the little horn. Uh, chapter 9 would be Daniel's uh, intercession for his people uh, through prayer and the 70-week vision given by the angel Gabriel. Uh, chapter 10 uh, and, and again, 10, 11, and 12 go together as one unit. Uh, chapter 10 is the introduction of a great revelation to come, which we read of in chapter 11. And that revelation speaks of empires to come, uh, again, with the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and, and then the uh, northern and southern kingdoms uh, represented by Syria and Egypt, and then on into the Roman Empire and ultimately the Antichrist. And then finally, chapter 12 is uh, a revelation that Daniel received about the protection of the Jewish people in the future by Michael, the archangel, and uh, the great resurrection that was coming, which was one of the great hopes of their faith in God. So that's a very brief uh, overview of each of the 12 chapters. Of course, the main characters in Daniel were familiar with uh, Daniel, a Jewish exile and prophet of God, uh, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Belshazzar, uh, the king of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and then Darius and Cyrus, uh, those Medo-Persian kings, and then, of course, Gabriel and Michael, uh, the two angelic messengers uh, that are spoken of that bring this uh, great information to Daniel and also give him the great comfort and hope that he needs uh, in light of the revelations that he's received. And so with that, let's go ahead and begin a summary of each chapter. And again, we're going to break these down with a brief outline and just a uh, one or two verses uh, for each of those outline points that give us an understanding of what is taking place in that chapter. So chapter one, again, is the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and so we see in verse 1 that Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah and he takes captives into the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, verse 2 says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Uh, that is a great statement of sovereignty without using the word sovereignty. Uh, God was accomplishing exactly what he wanted to do. And so his plan was to turn over Jehoiakim and Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar could not have stepped foot into Jerusalem with any success or, or even invaded Jerusalem uh, if God had not allowed and ordained those things to take place. And so here we see that great statement of sovereignty. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Uh, in verses 3 through 7, you see the training of the captives. Uh, there is a cultural retraining in verses 3 through 5. That is through their education and through their diet. Uh, and then there's a cultural renaming. So they were not only trained to, to think and eat like the Babylonians, but they were also renamed. And that was to kind of a washing of their total identity as Jewish people. And so Daniel became Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah became Abednego. And we read about that in verses 6 and 7. In verses 8 through 16, we see the first challenge for the captives uh, in Babylon. Uh, verse 8 uh, reveals to us Daniel's great resolve. Uh, he made up his mind that he would not defile himself. Now, this is with the king's food. Uh, he and his companions did not want to eat this food, uh, most likely because it was sacrificed to idols. Uh, and so we see his resolve in verse 8. Uh, in verse 9, we see God's grace. God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. So even in captivity, God is pouring out his mercy and his grace upon the very people that are being punished. Now, although we don't read anything specifically about Daniel's sin, we know that he was a man who wasn't free of sin. And when you read chapter 9, uh, Daniel really reveals that understanding that he knows he and his people have sinned against God. Uh, and yet God's grace continues to be poured out upon Daniel and his companions. And so verse 9 uh, is a reminder of that. God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. Uh, and then also in that section, we see the commander's uh, acquiescence uh, in verses 14 through 16. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So there was that great issue that was challenged, or that was a challenge that was issued. Uh, Daniel says, if you just give us some time, uh, let us have this food instead. And if we don't look healthy by the end of this period of time, we will eat what you ask us to eat. And God provided for them. And so they looked more healthy than anyone else after that 10-day period. Now, when we go to verses 17 through 21, we'll see the reward for the captives. Uh, they were challenged in verses 8 through 16. They stood firm in their convictions. Now God is rewarding them in verses 17 through 21. So we see God's grace for knowledge, verse 17. God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And so here we see the introduction to Daniel's career in Babylon. He was going to be this great prophet of God who was going to understand dreams and visions that no one in the Babylonian or Persian empires uh, could make sense of. And that's because God was giving Daniel these great revelations. 
So we see that in verse 17, God's grace for knowledge. We also see in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar's appointment for service. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. So now they are put into service for Nebuchadnezzar. And then we finally see in verse 21, Daniel's life of faithful service. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. That one statement gives us a span of Daniel's entire 70-year career in Babylon. He began serving Nebuchadnezzar, and he served all the way through the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And so God was very, very gracious uh, to these captives, and we see all of that uh, beginning in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we see this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And so as we look at verses 1 through 3, we see his troubling dream. Verse 3 says, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar has this incredible dream. He has no idea what it means, and he is uh, seeking answers. And so he demands the impossible. That's verses 4 through 11, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's impossible demand. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. That's verses 10 and 11. And so as they were issued uh, this challenge, Uh, They were told, you give me the answer or you're going to uh, suffer. And we'll see that in verses 12 through 18. Uh, His wise men come back to him and say, you are asking the impossible. No one can give you these answers except the gods themselves. In verses 12 through 18, you see Nebuchadnezzar's decree of death. When he is not receiving the information he desires from his wise men, uh, he calls for their slaughter. Verse 12 says, Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. That would have included Daniel and his companions. Remember, they were trained to serve the king. And so when Daniel found out, verses 17 and 18, Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. And so when they heard about what was going to happen, they immediately went to prayer, not just for themselves, but for the entire kingdom, because they knew that many people were going to be slaughtered because Nebuchadnezzar was not receiving uh, the information he demanded. In verses 19 through 30, we see that Daniel receives the explanation of the dream. Verse 19 says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And verse 28 says, However, There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. So what we see happening there from verses 19 through 30 is that Daniel is given the answer to the vision, and he goes and he tells Nebuchadnezzar that he has the answer, but he makes sure that Nebuchadnezzar knows from the very beginning this knowledge, this wisdom, this answer is not coming from Daniel. It is coming from God himself. And it is declaring to Nebuchadnezzar the things that will take place in the future. Verses 31 through 45 is Daniel explaining the meaning of the vision. And so he does that uh, in verses 31 through 35. He describes the dream. It is this great image that Nebuchadnezzar has seen. And in verses 36 through 43, we understand that it represents five earthly kingdoms the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and then ultimately what many believe is a rebuilt or renewed Roman kingdom during the end times. And so those are the five earthly kingdoms represented by Nebuchadnezzar's statue or the image dream. And then verses 44 through 45 is a description of the heavenly kingdom. And in verse 44 it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And so as you have centuries of Gentile dominance and and wicked kings who are sitting on thrones and and just uh, doing whatever they desire and rebelling against God, 
in the end, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom and that kingdom will never be destroyed. Again, we see the sovereignty of God in action as he sets up his kingdom and he puts an end to all the Gentile kings and kingdoms. And then in uh, verses 46 through 49, uh, Nebuchadnezzar promotes Daniel and he acknowledges God. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And so Nebuchadnezzar realizes that uh, Daniel is a very special man and that the God Daniel serves is unlike any of the gods of the Babylonian empire that he is a greater God. Now, I don't think Nebuchadnezzar is saved at this point, but I think before we, we finish his story in the book of Daniel, we see a converted man. Well, let's move on to chapter three. There is the dedication of the king's image, and we see this, this massive statue that is, is constructed and placed on the plain of Dura, and there is worship that is demanded. In verses one through seven, we see that dedication. Verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Uh, then in verse 5, we see this mandate, this decree, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down, this is verses 6 and 7, uh, and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And so we see the king's demand. He builds this image, and he is calling for the entire kingdom, all of his subjects, to worship him. And if they do not fall down and worship, when they hear the sound of the music, they are going to be put to death. Uh, in verses 8 through 12, we see the disregard for the king's command. Uh, verse 12 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Uh, as we see throughout the book of Daniel, especially in chapters 1 through 6, there are those in the Babylonian empire who hate the Jewish people. They hate the captives. They want to see them fail. They want to see them punished. They want to see them destroyed. Uh, and our focus uh, that we see is mainly with Daniel and his companions. Uh, it probably happened to others as well. I think it's safe to say that uh, this was not just focused on these men, but anyone uh, that seemed to be a challenge to the Babylonian king and their gods. Well, as these three companions of Daniel uh, are not bowing down to worship, uh, there are those who bring these accusations. They tell the king they have disregarded you, they disrespect you, they dishonor you. These men are rebels, uh, and they need to be destroyed. In verses 13 through 30, we see the deliverance from the king's wrath. Verse 13 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, then these men were brought before the king. So they're given an opportunity to answer for themselves and bow down. Verse 15 says, If you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? And so Nebuchadnezzar brings them before him uh, himself and he says, Look, you have one opportunity. Bow down and worship. But if you don't, no God can save you from my wrath. That's verse 15. Verses 16 through 18. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, uh, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And, and so we see uh, much here about the integrity of these men. Uh, I believe it's clear that they are not disrespecting the king. There is no dishonor on their part. They recognize Nebuchadnezzar as king, and, and they still bow to their human sovereign. But they understand that what Nebuchadnezzar is asking is to stand against God himself. And they must worship God rather than this human king. And, and so without disrespecting him, 
Um, of course, Nebuchadnezzar takes it as an act of disrespect. Um, they also show their integrity and, and their commitment to God himself. We will not worship. And if that means death, well then so be it. We will not bow. Verse 21, these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and they were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And so the judgment was carried out. They're thrown into this blazing furnace. But in verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and says, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And so Nebuchadnezzar, as he looks in, he knows three men went into the furnace, but he sees four. And he says, one of them looks like a god. And many people believe that this is either a theophany or a Christophany. It is a manifestation of God himself protecting Daniel's companions. And so Nebuchadnezzar makes another proclamation in verses 29 through 30. There is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. And, and so as he made that, that statement earlier, no God can deliver you from my hand. Now he is saying there is no God who can deliver in this way. Uh, God is really working on Nebuchadnezzar's heart. He is working uh, to soften his hardness against him. And I think in the next chapter, chapter 4, we're going to see the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. And so let's look at chapter 4. Uh, there is another dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. But he begins this section, and it's interesting. We hear firsthand from Nebuchadnezzar through much of this chapter. Verses 1 through 3 is Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation of praise. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. That sounds like a converted man. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And so there we see in verses 2 and 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes it very clear there is one sovereign God. There is one Most High. And what he has done for me, I must tell to you. I must share with you. And so we see the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, uh, verses 4 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar's dream revealed. Verse 5 says, I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. And so what he saw was concerning to him. It was terrifying him. Uh, and so he calls for his wise men again. Verse 7, Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. And so this is the same thing that happened with the previous dream. Uh, he had a dream. He didn't know the meaning of it. He calls his wise men. They have no answers for him. Verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation. And so knowing that his uh, magicians and conjurers, sorcerers, the Chaldeans, the wise men, knowing that they had no answers, he once again turns to Daniel and uh, he is asking for the interpretation. And that's what we read about in verses 19 through 33. Uh, and so this is the, the section where Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are going to go insane. Your sovereignty will be stripped from you. Uh, you're going to live out in the wilderness like an animal. You're going to look like an animal. Your hair is going to grow wild. Your nails are going to be like claws, like talons. And you're going to be there for seven years. And so Daniel's concern uh, for Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we see the, the honesty and we, we see the integrity of Daniel. We see his concern for others. Verse 19, he says, My Lord, if only the dream apply to those who hate you, and its interpretation to your adversaries. He says, this is not good news. I wish that it did not apply to you. I wish it applied to someone else. Uh, and then Nebuchadnezzar is struck down. We know that while he's there on his palace, he's thinking about his greatness. Before he can even speak the words, he is struck down. Sovereignty is removed from him, and he receives in its place madness. And he lives like an animal for seven years. Well, 
Uh, you see in verse 33, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And so he was uh, stripped of all of his sovereignty and glory and he was driven out into the wilderness to live like a wild animal. And that was part of this judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar by God. But we see in verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation of praise. And so you see the book ends in chapter 4, the praise that Nebuchadnezzar gives to God. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. And that is how chapter 4 ends. We see this proclamation uh, from Nebuchadnezzar that there is one God and that he's finally been humbled and he understands who he is. And, and that is where we see the, the exit of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is no longer uh, in charge when we get into chapter 5. In chapter 5, we find one of Nebuchadnezzar's descendants, Belshazzar, who is the king. And in chapter 5, that is that section where we see the great handwriting on the wall. Verses 1 through 4 is Belshazzar's prideful and irreverent feast. Verses 1 and 4 say this, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And so they are taking... Uh, these items that were there in their uh, temple, probably stolen from Jerusalem in the Jewish temple, and they're using them to praise false gods. And as they're having this irreverent feast, we see God's message of judgment uh, to prideful Belshazzar. That is verses 5 through 9. And so let's read verse 5 and verse 9. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. And so as he is there with all of his uh, guests, he sees the handwriting on the wall and he is terrified. He has no idea what's happening here. And so we look at verses 10 through 16. Daniel is called to interpret the message. And let's read verses 13 and 16. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? But I personally have heard about you, that you were able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as third ruler, ruler in the kingdom. And so Belshazzar is telling Daniel, I've heard about you. You're the same one who gave the answers to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, mysteries. And if you can do for me what you did for him, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to make you the third most powerful person in my kingdom. And of course, we know Daniel is not seeking any wealth or any human accolades. He just wants to serve the Lord. And so we see the interpretation that is given to Daniel in verses 17 through 28. Verse 22 and 23, uh, Daniel is reminding uh, Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's failure to honor God. And in verse 22, he says, Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. He says, You know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but you haven't humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. And so Daniel lays down the groundwork for the judgments that's coming. Because you elevated, exalted yourself above God himself, you are going to be judged. And in verses 25 through 28, he gives the interpretation. Now, this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, teko ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. And, and so we see here 
this prophecy of the end of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire. And before we finish this chapter, we see fulfilled prophecy, verses 29 through 31. Uh, then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. And so Daniel gave the interpretation. Belshazzar honored him as he said he would, but he died that very night. And there was the fall of one empire and the rise of another. Well, let's look at chapter 6. And chapter 6 is going to end the, his, the history portion of Daniel. And then we'll make the transition to the prophetic focus in 7 through 12. Chapter 6, we now see that there is a new king in town. There's a new empire that is in charge. And we see the elevation of Daniel. Uh, verse 3, Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. As the kingdom was appointing satraps to be uh, rulers, uh, as he could not be in every part of the kingdom, Daniel was one of these leaders. And uh, he was rising above the rest. And uh, the king's plan was to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Basically make him second in command. Second only to the king himself. And as I mentioned earlier, there are many people in these kingdoms who do not like the Jewish captives. And we're going to see more about that in chapter 6. And we're going to see the integrity of Daniel in verses 4 and 5. Then the command, or the commissioners and satraps begin trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. And these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So as they found out Daniel was going to be elevated to this position of great authority and honor, they did not want him in that position. So they began to scrutinize him. They wanted to see if they can dig up any dirt on Daniel, and they were not able to find anything. What they did know was that Daniel was a man who was committed to his God. And if there was going to be any place they could catch Daniel, it was going to be uh, in relation to his religious life, in, in relation to his faith, his commitment to God. That's where the attack had to come. And so there was a plot against Daniel, verses 6 through 9. And we read in verse 7, All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. And so these men really had no true desire to to magnify their king. But they knew that if the mandate uh, to worship no one, to pray to no one else other than the king for 30 days, that Daniel would not be able to fulfill that demand, that he would continue to pray to his God. And in their minds, it was an open and shut case. They would be able to bring accusations and evidence that Daniel was not faithful to the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. And so we see the accusations come against Daniel in verses 10 through 13. We read in verse 13, Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Daniel was a man who went up to his upper room and he prayed three times a day facing Jerusalem. He was facing back towards home to where the temple was and he was praying on behalf of his people, entreating God, interceding for the people. And they saw him. Daniel made no attempt to hide what he was doing. And they come to the king and say, Daniel is praying to someone else, not once, but three times every single day. And then you look at verses 14 and 15. There is great concern for Daniel because Darius knew that he had to fulfill his word and he had to cast Daniel into the lion's den. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed 
and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. And so he had no choice. If he did not send Daniel to his death in the lion's den, then the people of his kingdom would know that he is not a man of his word. And so then he sends Daniel, a man that he appreciated, he respected. We can say he loved him as a friend and a servant. And uh, he was he was distraught because he knew an innocent man was going to his death. A good man was going to his death. But then God delivered Daniel. We read about his deliverance in verses 16 through 24. And Daniel says this, when, when Darius is rushing to that lion's pit, uh, that den, and calling in to see if Daniel is okay. Daniel's response is, My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. And so Daniel says, I'm fine, God has delivered me. And so Daniel is exalted, verses 25 through 28. And so we see here that Darius says, He, God, delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And so there we see kind of a, a final statement on the service of Daniel during this captivity. Uh, he goes from Nebuchadnezzar through Belshazzar through Darius and Cyrus and, and he is a man who maintains his integrity both to God and man every step of the way.